Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Directors agenda meeting uh, for today, October 30th, as we go about to set up the uh, uh, activities for our agenda uh, meeting on November 5th. We have a lot of presentations to uh, take care of first before we get into talking about our agenda. So first of all, uh, let me call on, uh, I believe, uh, Jamie Collins uh, for the recognition of uh, our Planning and Development Department for the Achievement in Technology Award that we have won from the Arkansas chapter of the American Planning Association. Ja Jamie? Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the board, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something we, that uh, was turned in that we want to do with our technology as far as our GIS mapping, and we're going to explain a little bit of that in the future. And all I can say is, you know, a, a department, you know, we don't have very many uh, awards that we get, like through ISO certification, like some departments and everything. So getting these awards means a lot to us. And, uh, you know, it was not I that did it, but the staff that worked with me, you know, they, they deserve all the credit for this presentation. So with that, I would like to call up Miss Julie Luther. She is the uh, secretary of the Arkansas Chapter of the APA, and she'll, uh, you know, present the award. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Luther Kelso, and I am a member of the executive committee of the Arkansas Chapter of the American Planning Association. And I'm very excited to be here this afternoon to recognize outstanding work here in our community. The American Planning Association provides leadership in the development of vital communities by advocating excellence in planning, promoting education and citizen empowerment, and providing our members with the tools and support necessary to meet the challenges of growth and change. Each year, the Arkansas chapter recognizes excellent planning work across the state at our fall conference which was held in Siloam Springs last month. This year, we had 13 award nominations across various categories. Um, only one recipient is awarded per category uh, each year. And we issued five awards this year. They were juried by the Louisiana chapter of the American Planning Association. So these were uh, critiqued by other professionals in a, in a different state. Um, one of those awards was issued to the City of Little Rock Department of Planning and Development. It is the 2018 Achievement in Technology Award, and it's for the Historic Sites Web Application. Initiated by Brian Minyard, staff for the Historic District Commission, the Historic Sites Web Application, developed by the City of Little Rock Planning and Development Department, is one of the best tools available to locate historic properties in the City of Little Rock and areas south of the river. This web app is a unique and innovative application of technology to the planning process. It utilizes Esri Web Application Builder as a jumping off point for the customization using JavaScript, HTML5, and PHP. Congratulations to the City of Little Rock Department of Planning and Development. Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Board of Directors, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to have this presentation. I would like to introduce Thomas Melton. He is our GIS analyst uh, with the City of Little Rock and the Planning Department. Thomas is the one that made all of this work. I have no idea the JavaScript, et cetera. Yeah, but he's, he's the background that makes all this work. He also contributed a lot of the information that's on the site, too. I've been asked to go, to go through the website, how to find it, and the things that are on the website. And Scott's doing our presentation in the back. So next slide, please. Uh, when you go to our City of Little Rock homepage, especially for the visitor, I mean, excuse me, for the viewers, uh, go to the homepage, littlerock.gov, go to Four Businesses, and pull down the menu to Planning and Development uh, page. Next, please. And, whoops, excuse me, go back one. Um, when you're there at the Planning and Development page, scroll down to the interactive maps, the little icon that you see under helpful information. Next, please. That will get you to our launch page. On this page, Thomas has developed not only our site, but a bunch of other apps for different departments, public safety, public works, parks, housing, et cetera. 
on the very first thing you see web application guide is some instructions on how to use the app if you're not as web friendly. Uh, next one, Scott, please. Uh, contents, and these are uniform toward all the applications of the title bar, the toolbar, widgets, etc. cetera. Uh, next, please. On the bottom of each of them, you'll have these nine different widgets where you can search by an address under number one with the little magnifying glass. Number four is the layer list. You can turn things off and on. Number five, you can choose your base map. Next, please. If you scroll down far enough, you'll see the Historic Sites app, the one on the very far left. That's the one that we won the award for. Uh, next, please. When you go through the disclaimer and check that you uh, that checkbox, this is the first thing that pops up. Each one of these icons is a National Register individually listed property. The icons show whether it's a statue, a building, an industrial site, etc. Next. Uh, if you click on one of them, what you'll do, you'll bring up a photo of the building. Uh, next. And if you scroll down on that bar, you'll see the address of the building, approximate year of construction, a little paragraph about what that building is about. The reviewing agency, it tells you if you're in capital zoning or it tells you if you're in the MacArthur Park Local Ordinance Historic District. This doesn't happen to be. And then you've got additional links. Also, you see click on photo above for additional photos. Next one, please. It'll bring up, on this case, we've got five different photos ranging from this 1920 photo up to the present. And so you get to see more about uh, the actual building. Next, please. On the additional information, uh, this is the National Register of Historic Places actual nomination that gives you a lot of information. We've got some on the agenda for next um, week an average of like 20 pages of in-depth research about each individual building. Next. Uh, the next thing, if you look on your left, you see the layer list, historic sites, other historic locations. This is something that Thomas uh, decided to do. We have uh, Sanborn maps, which are insurance maps of from 1970 before. And you can click on each of the little yellow icons. For example, at 4th and River Market Avenue in 1897, we had a German casino on that site. <laughs> and you can click on all those different ones. There's, you know, and some of the buildings are still there. Some of them, of course, have been lost to history. Next, please. We also have historic street photos. Uh, this one is uh, in 1910 on uh, Main on Main Street facing north. Uh, next. Uh, this is something that we've done a lot of the downtown area, but we're working uh, with a institution of higher learning to hopefully get a lot more done. Uh, 11th Street was named Severe at one point in time uh, until, they were, until they were changed. That gives you a little info about who the Severes were, Ambrose Hunley Severe. Uh, next. This is a map of all of the streetcar lines that we had. We were able to find 10, ten different maps of different eras to show where all the different, the different lines were located. We've also found a couple of trolley poles in the area where the lines were strong. And so we hope to get photos of those and be able to put those on the map so you can go and see what a trolley pole actually looks like. There's one at the new roundabout at McKinley and Cavanaugh. It's on the south side. It'll look like a pole, but yeah, if it's if it's mapped, yeah, you'll you'll know. Okay, next next slide, please. Uh, this is all of the uh, National Register historic districts. So if you're wondering if you are in a district, go to the little magnifying glass on the bottom, click it, type in your address. It will zoom you to that spot, and then you'll know whether you're, if you're in a historic district or not. Uh, next, uh, this one is really cool. If you zoom out far enough, what this is, this is the annexations in the city of Rock grouped into 10-year periods. So everything in that decade. Uh, the little widget on the very far right that looks like a little clock, if you click on that, it starts with the original city in 1828 and then it gradually grows those polygons so you can see how the city has grown southwesterly and westerly over time. So each 10-year increment it, it moves along. Uh, next, 
This is a, uh, the general land office plats, GLO plats, those are from 18, what year, 18? Varies from 1820 until the 1850s. 1820s, 1850s. Thomas has aligned those so that they match with our current streets. So you can go in and find your address again and see where that is. And what's interesting about this is it has names of early settlers and early farmsteads and early creeks. So you can see that Brody Creek and Brody Subdivision in Brody Park was named after an actual farmer named Brody, and you see where his farm was. Uh, and the next one is um, gives you more of the base map. The examples I've shown are just on the basic base map, but we've got 2015 aerials, 2012, 1998, 1943 aerials that show you before any freeways were installed in the city. Uh, and then you go the GLO plats. Uh, Thomas is currently working on the 1960 aerials so that you can compare and contrast what was in the neighborhood before and after, if it was all trees and pine trees or whether you know something was there. Uh, next. And then, of course, you can, you can move those uh, legends around so that you can see uh, more things or next. You can just... Uh, you can get rid of the legends and the layer list altogether. And this is just showing that you can pull these, this information up on top of the aerial photo or on top of the base map or on top of the GLO. It all works with you. You can switch the base layers out. Uh, next. And then that's showing you whether you can just take all of the legends out and just pan around. You can pan, you can zoom, et cetera. So there's a, a lot of information on there. We hope to have some more information on it in the next couple of years, uh, but we thought it was at a point to where, you know, we could, we could submit and, and win an award for it at the time. So hopefully this is our first of <coughs> several awards uh, for this site. Uh, thank, thank you, Brian. Thank you very uh, much. Very, very interesting, fascinating, a great uh, educational session as well. I would imagine thank you. Uh, some of the Central High folks that are here tonight might be seeing a project involved here in the future. <laughs> Uh, Director Richardson, you have a comment, please. You're recognized. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I want to echo to your points that you just recently made, but I certainly, I think Bruce and Tom would know this, and she's probably not going to like me doing this. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Julie um, Luther, who's done some tremendous work with us. I mean, she's operates mayor from the mindset of you do things, you help others because it's the right thing to do, not for recognition or acknowledgement or compensation, but she spent a tremendous amount of time intimately with the city and working with us on our 12th Street revitalization work as one of two consultants. And because of their work, Mayor, we were able to see the Arkansas Planning Association 2010 Urban Design Awards. I want to acknowledge and thank Julie for her work. And I know she doesn't like me doing this because she likes working behind the scene and doesn't want any recognition or acknowledgement. And congratulations again, guys. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, we have a couple of... Um, um, uh, high school recognitions that I'm going to go ahead and take care of. So I'm going to turn this, not that it's necessary, over to the vice mayor, and I'll be down at the dais in just a moment. Now, being an old tennis player, I'm extremely excited to be able to recognize our central uh, high school Little Rock Boys 6A tennis team. Uh, on October 9th of 2018, the Little Rock Central Tigers won the 6A Boys Tennis State Championship. And this was their 15th state championship in boys tennis. Uh, it was the first since 1982, though, so it's uh, quite a significant victory. Last year, the team was first runner-up, so they were very pleased to be back this year as champions. There are three members of that team that were named to the All-State uh, team, uh, Andrew Maxson, Philip Abston, and uh, Zandi Jurica. 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 Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, Leandra Crook is the coach of the team, and of course Nancy Rousseau is the principal. And I see Mike Poor, our superintendent, along with Marvin Burton, is also the associate superintendent, and Ernest McGee, who's the athletic director, they're here as well. So I'd like to present the... Uh, Plaque to the boys' uh, uh, championship tennis team, if they come forward. And next year. All right. So
so, so Director Peck, Peck made a special request since uh, since um, uh, Zandy works for her and she never gets to make a presentation. She wanted to at least get her picture taken with the person that does such a great job. It's not? No, it's because it's Zandy. Right. You hold this. Because I can say his last name. You had to practice, though. I know. Okay, do we have a spokesperson? Andrew, oh, Andrew that's all you. <laughs> all right, get up here. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, turn around. Oh, Speak to the mic. mic. All right. You guys um, watch. I would like to say thank you, especially to Miss Crook and all the parents that were so helpful this year. Um, I'm sad to be leaving these guys because it's my senior year, but you know, it always go Tigers, and thank you, Miss Russo. Mr. McGee for coming and supporting us this season, and hopefully we have another good season next year. And would the parents uh, of uh, that are here tonight please stand? And of course, I see Nancy and Marvin, and and uh, and um, our superintendent is here. Of course, stand and be recognized. You know, thank you for uh, such a great job uh, on what you do and the, the pride that you bring to our city. Um, we have one more. Uh, not only did we uh, have the state championship team, but we also, in addition to that, we have Central's Andrew Maxim, who won the boys' singles uh, 6A state A championship. And he defeated opponents from Rogers, Catholic High, and Bentonville West on the way to the championship. He dropped only one set during the tournament. And that was in the final match, but obviously he was victorious. So, Andrew? <laughs> now we know why you were the spokesperson. <laughs> Way to go, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we, we, I said all their names, so. Coming back, coming back. Say our names. Sure. All right. I mentioned your name. I'm Andrew Maxson. Hey, I'm Zandy Jerica. Good to be here. Uh, I'm Philip Abson. Jake Maxson. Ben Heflin. And there's Dennis Verall. One missing. Okay, very good. Thank you, guys. Central is also very proud to uh, have another significant achievement this year. On October 18th of 2018, uh, Stacy McAdoo arrived at Little Rock Central High School and received a big surprise. During a special presentation, Governor Asa Hutchinson and Arkansas Department of Education Commissioner Johnny Key recognized uh, Stacy McAdoo as the 2019 Arkansas Teacher of the Year. Ms. McAdoo is a 16-year educator, teaches communication and advanced and advancement via individual determination called AVID uh, for grades 9 through 12 at the Little Rock Central High School here in our Little Rock School District. Stacy McAdoo incorporates rap and slam poetry in the classroom, utilizing creative opportunities to foster parent, community, and civic engagement. She guides her students to think outside the box, uh, and she has taught speech communication at Little Rock Central High since 2002, and has taught both speech communication and AVID since 2007. Through AVID, uh, Ms. McAdoo provides support to help students prepare for college. And because of her efforts, Little Rock Central High School has been named a highly certified AVID school since 2007. A graduate of Hall High, I know we have two directors proud of that, she has a Bachelor's of Arts in Professional and Technical Writing from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and a Master's of Arts in Teaching from the University of Arkansas at Monticello. And she has uh, been certified to teach in various, uh, various areas. Uh, having received the Distinguished High School Mentor Award, 
in 2017. Ms. McAdoo is the 2018 Little Rock Central High Teacher of the Year, the 2018 Little Rock uh, School District Teacher of the Year, and of course the 29 uh, or the 2019 Arkansas Teacher of the Year Regional Finalist. In addition to a paid year-long sabbatical that will begin July 1st of 2019, Ms. McAdoo will receive an additional $14,000 award sponsored by the Walton Family Foundation. So, congratulations, Stacy McAdoo. We are so proud to have you as one of our teachers. I just want to thank you guys for the recognition and let you all know that I have been, I am a 42-year resident of Little Rock, and I am proud of my city. I am proud and honored to represent the Little Rock School District, Little Rock Central High School, and we th I am now thrown in the hat to represent Arkansas across the state. Well, I have made it for the state, but my name is now in the hat to make it for the country. So I hope that you guys keep me in your thoughts and prayers and know that however far I make it, I will gladly represent um, the city of Little Rock. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stacy. Uh, let me call on Nancy Rousseau, uh, the principal of Central High. I suspect she has a few thoughts about uh, why Stacy is so deserving of this award. Well, to start, I hired her. <laughs> That's a true story. She, uh, should, I, should I tell the story? Okay. When I was principal at Pulaski Heights, I had this adorable pregnant lady come to see me. She, I think it was it was your, it was Narelle. So it was your first your y'all's first baby, and um, she said, "I want to be a teacher." And I said, you do? And we had this great conversation about teaching. And at that time, she said she wanted to be an English teacher, which, of course, pleased me to death because I taught English for 18 years. So that was music to my ears. Anyway, I told her. I was very impressed with her. And I said, I'll tell you what. You get all your credentials because she was not finished with school. And I said, you come back and see me, and I'll hire you. And the rest is history. So... <laughs> Um, I, she is a marvelous teacher. If we had schools full of teachers like Miss Stacy McAdoo, we would probably have far fewer struggles in education. Um, she, the kids love her so much. It's, it was really fun when she got this award to watch the exchange. You know, it was at first they we, they were so proud and happy for her, and then all of a sudden it it, it dawned on them that she wasn't going to be there next year. So the smiles ended up being tears. And, uh, but we're very proud of her. She's just, she's truly magic in the classroom. So, and thank you for the recognition for her because she deserves it. Thank you. Mayor. Well, thank you, Nancy. And uh, Stacy. do you have any uh, of your relatives or colleagues here with you? Absolutely. You want to have them stand up and be recognized? Mayor, we've got a couple of board members who would like to make a comment. All right, go right ahead, McAdoo. please. And we would like a clarification that there are three graduates of Hall High on the oh, Little Dean. Wright City Board. <laughs> oh, I forgot Dean. <laughs> I, I forgot you. They, they speak up about Hall High so, so vocally. You're just a quiet, calming sense. Uh, Director Wright. Congratulations to you all that don't know this. This is one of my Ward 6 families. I am so proud of the McAdoos. And if you want to see some talent, you listen to the, their children. If you think she's talented, all the children are really talented. I'm very, very proud of you. Congratulations. And I know you're going to go far and represent Little Rock well. And I look forward to seeing great things. Director Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I certainly want to 
to acknowledge the McAdoo's there. Certainly have had an impact uh, on a number of people in our community. I don't think you can meet uh, any family that's nicer, more engaging, or spiritually grounded, grounded than this family right here. And I will say this, Mayor, um, hail to the old goal as a proud graduate from Central High School. <laughs> the best high school in the state of Arkansas, the United States of America, and the world. Hail to the old goal, to the best high school in the world, Mayor. Believe that. I, were, I certainly want to acknowledge the McAdoo. They're so, they've had so much impact in a number of different arenas and a number of different young people in our community. And I want to echo Ms. Rousseau's, Ms. Rousseau's comments about if we had more teachers like her, we'd have far less problems in our community and more productive, positive young people in our community. So I certainly want to thank you guys for what you do and what you've done for our community. And I want to say once again, hail to the old goal. <laughs> uh, Director Rancock. Yes, Mayor, I want to... I tell everyone that I graduated from Central High in 57, 58, and at that time, Director Richardson probably was in elementary school. <laughs> Wasn't even born. So, so the oldest and the youngest on the board graduated from Central. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're not finished with our presentations. Uh, let me call on uh, City Director Lance Hines. Uh, for the uh, next um, uh, recognition. Mayor, Vice Mayor, fellow board members, City Manager Moore, we're here to recognize uh, three different state champions, uh, all from the same school today. Uh, first, we'll be starting with the Baptist Preparatory School 3A Girls Golf uh, State Champion. On September 26, 2018, junior Bailey Grace Dunstan won the Girls Individual 3A State Golf Championship. Her score was 66, which is 23 strokes lower than the second place finisher. That was the largest margin of victory for any 2018 State Golf Champion in any class, boys or girls. It is also the largest margin of victory for either boys or girls in any class since at least 2014. For the past two years, she was runner-up for the state championship, but the first place winner was a teammate and her older sister. Angie Hopkins coaches the girls' golf at Baptist Prep. Dr. Laura Bednar is the head of school. Levi Miller is the upper school principal, and Steve Miller is the athletic director. Uh, let me have the bike. Uh, Belly Grace, if you'd come up. In golf, the Arkansas Activities Association invites. Did I get it? Okay. All right. Uh, invites the top finishers from each classification to play in an overall championship. Bailey participated in this on October 11th at Pleasant Valley Country Club. After finishing with a 76, she was tied with a golfer from Bentonville. Bailey won the playoff to capture the overall girls golf championship. Incidentally, her 76 was one stroke lower than the boys overall championship winner. So Bailey, I got two plaques to give you. I'm going to read them both to you. Mayor Mark Stuttle of the city board of directors and city manager Bruce T. Moore congratulates Bailey Grace Dunstan, the Baptist preparatory school 2018 3A Girls Golf State Champion. And then the other plaque says the 2018 Girls Golf Overall State Championship. In the quest for the championship, the player and coach exemplified outstanding sportsmanship, participation, leadership, responsibility, and teamwork. Congratulations. <laughs> Bailey, you want to... Let's say a few words and coach you want to if you want to come up and talk about her too okay um i would like to thank Here, just talk in okay the, um i would like to thank my parents and my golf coach coach hopkins for everything that they've done for me for taking me to the tournaments and i'd also like to thank my teammates they're not here but they did a great job considering we had a brand new team this year because we had seniors graduate but thank you And obviously the scores 
are, are just unbelievable of what she's done, but that's nothing compared to um, her character on and off the course and in the classroom. And she's just a wonderful young lady that I think will go on and represent the city of Little Rock and the state of Arkansas in some great college. Is gonna be lucky to have her. <laughs> Bailey, are your parents here? Did they come? They didn't come, okay. Well, we'll recognize them, but we're glad they're here. All right, next up, we're doing So next up, the Baptist Preparatory 3A Boys Tennis. On October 9, 2018, Seth Hernandez of Baptist Preparatory won the 3A Boys Singles Individual Tennis State Championship. This is Seth's third Boys Singles Tennis State title. His freshman year, he lost in the finals, but has won the championship as a sophomore, junior, and now a senior. In this year's tournament, he defeated players from Newport, Harding Academy, and Riverview. He only dropped three games in the entire tournament, winning all of his sets. Seth was named to the All-State team this year, his fourth time to receive this honor. Mark Thompson coaches the boys' tennis at Baptist Prep. Dr. Laura Bender is head of school. Levi Miller, the upper school principal, and Steve Miller is the athletic director. Seth, please come up and uh, receive your plaque. <laughs> so this plaque states, Mayor Mark Stodel of the City Board of Directors and City Manager Bruce T. Moore congratulates Seth Hernandez, the Baptist Preparatory School 2018 3A Boys Tennis Single State Championship. In the quest for the championship, the player and coaches exemplified outstanding sportsmanship, participation, leadership, responsibility, and teamwork. Congratulations, Seth. So, Seth, you can say a few words, and if you know where you're going to school, it sounds like you may have a few offers from folks to come play tennis for. So, um, Hi. Thank you for the recognition today. and It's an honor to be here. And um, even though I'm a senior, I don't know where I'm going yet for college. <laughs> Hopefully I'll figure it out really soon. But uh, I'd like to thank my, my parents and my coaches and for all of their hard work and helping me to get here today. Thank you. Is Coach Thompson here? Yeah, his mom. Okay. Uh, Seth's mom is here. If you stand up and be recognized, Mr. Hernandez. <laughs> We've got one last. This is for the Baptist Preparatory 3A Boys Golf. On October Second, 2018, the Baptist Prep Eagles won the boys' 3A Team Golf State Championship. This was the team's eighth state championship with their first coming in 2005. The boys finished with a combined score of 235, which was 11 strokes lower than the second-place team. Hagen Sanchez, Evan Garcia, and Owen Baker were named to the 2018 Golf All-State Team. This is Mr. Sanchez's third year to be All-State and Mr. Baker's second year. Eddie Stevenson coaches the boys' golf at Baptist Prep. Dr. Laura Bednar is the head of school. Levi Miller is the upper school principal, and Steve Miller is the athletic director. If the boys' golf team will come up, I've got a plaque to present to them. And your, and your coach, if he's here, too. Oh, he's not. All right. Well, good. Then you guys get to do all the talking. All right, so the plaque says, Mayor Mark Stuttle, the City Board of Directors and City Manager Bruce T. Moore congratulates the Baptist Preparatory School 2018 3A Boys Golf State Championship. In the quest for the championship, the players and coaches exemplified outstanding sportsmanship, participation, leadership, responsibility, and teamwork. Congratulations, guys. So if you guys would introduce yourself, if you're seniors and you know where you're going to go to school, you can tell us that as well. And we'd also like to recognize any of their parents that are in the audience, if y'all would stand up. Uh, I'm Davis Jordan. Uh, my name is Owen Baker. I'm a junior this year. Hagen Sanchez. I'm a junior. Thanks, gentlemen. Looks like they may be back next year with just a bunch of juniors. Thank you very, very much.
Okay, very good. Uh, congratulations to everyone. A lot of great victories uh, for our, our schools and certainly a, a victory for our city as well. So thank you so much and keep up the good work. Uh, let me just say also a personal thank you to Scott Carter for putting all of this together for us. Thank you, Scott. Good job. Okay, uh, we can now move on to our consent agenda. Uh, we have items one through seven. Let me ask board members whether you have any questions on items one through seven. Uh, Director Wright, you're yes. first, please. Yes, Mayor, I'd like uh, a presentation on item six, resolution six. Uh, Director Wright, um, the city in 1999 entered into an agreement to use land that was purchased with a bond issue for a West Little Rock Park uh, as part of a first tee program which was being developed by the World Golf Foundation. And this particular program was to be named in honor uh, then of uh, Mr. Jackson T. Stevens uh, for all of his work for golf and for bringing golf to youth. The agreement involved the city, the World Golf Foundation, and a group called the First Tee at that time. And we kind of went along for a period of time, and then there have, we have found that there are some gaps in our contractual history that we need to get taken care of. But the main point is, is that the city owns the golf course and, and since 1999 has been responsible for its maintenance and upkeep. Earlier this year, you were asked to spend money to uh, purchase or to reimburse them for a HVAC system. What this does is make uh, appropriations for the last uh, four months of the year and also puts an obligation on the first tee in the city to clarify the little gaps in the contracts and get an ongoing contract set up in 2019. Okay. Mr. Moore, can you tell me whether or not we can incorporate these programs at one of our other golf courses? Because I saw something in your budget presentation where we were putting in an additional $246,000 for this park, for this golf course, and now I'm seeing this $160,000. Seems like an awful lot of money. Yes, ma'am. I mean, as you know, um, we're going to go through a, um, an evaluation uh, of all our golf operations uh, to determine, uh, you know, what the structure really needs to be like. Uh, operating four uh, in a city our size is something that we really need to examine. Mr. M Mayor, can we hold this item separate? Certainly. Thank you. All right, it'll be held uh, separately at the request of uh, Director Wright. Uh, Director Adcock, you're next, please. Yes, I also want item six held separate because I have questions on it. At a time that we're hearing that we <coughs> might close one of our golf courses and we're doing 160000 to operate this for four months, Bruce, that's um, quite a bit of money for four months. Is this paying staff also or is this just... <coughs> Maintenance it's very similar to our agreement with the art <coughs> center. Uh, we're responsible um, for the uh, maintenance and operations of the, uh, those facilities, and according to the ninety-nine year lease, I mean the nineteen ninety-nine lease, uh, we're obligated to pay for the maintenance of the um, the facility and the course. So I think, and again, that was something that uh, was just really realized uh, after looking at the, and Tom and his staff looking at the uh, contract uh, that was done by my predecessor in 99. But um, I think it was also the intention at that point it was going to be somewhat revenue neutral. Um, but uh, according to the language, and that's why uh, Mr. Carpenter and we all agree that by the first quarter, we need to um, uh, have a new contract in place. But again, that's pending the review of the operations. Uh, we also have Western Hills, as the board is aware, uh, that the city owns. So I, I, I think it's timely. Obviously, we're going through the parks master plan concept at this point. That will be part of the discussion. But I think having a separate evaluation of the golf course, the golf course, all, all four of them in Western Hills is something that we need to go through. And and the, the problem with this is, or not the problem, but the issue with this is, you know, the city as an attorney has 
uh, opined and determined that we're responsible uh, by contract. So uh, this gets us through the balance of this year, and then we'll uh, look at uh, what we do with the evaluation of the course. Okay. If you divide this up, that's $40,000 a month. That's $10,000 a week. And this has no salaries for staff in it? it no, as I said, and we can break that down as far as the, the what this goes toward, and we'll have that, we'll have John work with our staff to determine the exact, but this is what it costs to maintain the uh, golf operations. Does Mr. Eckhart oversee this also? Uh, he does not uh, uh, oversee it. I mean, the, the, the Parks Department works very closely with First Tee. Okay. Does this do anything on 2019? Is this strictly for just four months? Correct. Or does this say that we're going to then continue it in 2019? Well, uh, this will be each year. It's part of the annual budget process. Uh, it's a part of the outside agencies uh, that we have funded. Um, so, again, we'll when when the budget process is initiated next month, uh, we'll have that as an item. I'd like to see a income on this. How it compares with the expenditures, the income, and also the amount of staff that they have, and the amount of students who are served at this location. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I Mr. also Carp would like information on item number seven, please. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, before we go to that item seven, um, um, we do own the uh, First Tee building there, correct? That's yes. Adjacent to and, and whatever other buildings are out there. I mean, they're, they are owned uh, uh, by the city. Uh, of course, that's close to our animal uh, uh, animal village uh, in that same general vicinity. So I just want to make sure everybody knows we, we physically own those properties. Pardon? <laughs> Director Atkine, do you mind if we take other questions about item Fine. six? Okay, Director Wyrick. Well, um, I'd like to know um, the length of the contract. I'd like to know what the gaps are that you uncovered. I'd like to know the number of youth that are participating in this. And as Joan said, uh, the income that's coming into it. This is in Ward 7, and it's always been a good program. But um, I agree in the last few months we have uh, appropriated some money sizable money to it so I'd just like to understand you know what what our uh, responsibilities are to it uh, you said it started in 1999 and um, is there an end to the contract at this point or is it just unending the initial contract um, would have expired in 2014 and then there was an addendum to extend it through 2029 uh, for 15 more years okay well, those are details that I think we need before we um, vote on this next week. And then also, I just want to make a comment about number one. Um, this is in Ward 7, and it's an improvement that we have long been awaiting for. It gets uh, individuals over to our shopping at Bass Pro and Gateway Town Center. So I'm excited about getting this started. Thank you. Uh, Director Richardson, you wanted to comment on item six as well? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Bruce, point of clarification. The use of first tee golf course is not restricted to students. Is it not? Is it a public golf course? And and one cost that we don't have associated uh, at this course that we have with Hyman, Resmond, and War Memorial, but there's no purchase of golf carts. Is that correct? And just with respect to costs, one a couple of years ago, the cost associated with War Memorial was pretty much an aberration because we redid the greens. Is that correct? We had a special count of greens, and that drove up the cost of maintenance and operation at that one course. So first tee is not limited to its students. It's a public course. We have we don't have to purchase any golf carts over there. Uh, that drives down purchasing costs as well. So some of the the um, maintenance stuff kind of is a little bit less than what we see at uh, our other courses in there. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Webb on six. Please. Thank you. And it's just in addition to what Directors Adcock and Wyrick said, um, when they talked about the youth and the students, I think we also have a contract with them for children, youth, and families. And I want to make sure when we see these breakdowns on youth and students, we also know um, what the, how much money we're spending on those 
those particular contracts and how many students are served through that program as well since I believe this is money on top of that. Thank you. Okay, and Director Hines on item six, please. And just to clarify for all the fellow board members, the total operating cost for the facility and the golf course, just to operate the golf course and the facilities roughly a little over 500000 a year. So basically this 160000 appropriation is what the shortfall is for the remainder of this year. So it, it it's not really what the actual cost is. Uh, it's what it's been to operate over the whole year. The programming is run as a separate part of that and is not included in this revenue. Um, the golf course revenues that the golf course generates go in against the operating expense, just like our city courses do. I will say that based on just the overall operating cost, we operate, the first tee operates at less of a cost to operate 18 golf holes plus a practice facility, less than what most of the city courses cost. So it's run fairly, fairly low. Over the past seven or eight years, this is, this would be in probably the last two years, I would think, Bruce, that we, we have, First Tee has had to come to the city to come up with shortfalls in, in operating the course. The kind of the genesis of all this is the First Tee, uh, the biggest operating expense, of course, is the golf course itself and the, and the facility. The programming and those salaries are, are for staff are paid out of that. So it, it, and I think that was probably the misnomer in this, the 160,000 is what the shortfall is of the year of a total budget, roughly to operate a course around 500,000, which is a little bit less than what our, we're, we're paying to operate our other courses. To that, to that accord, we do have some golf carts out there, but not enough, which hampers our play. But it is a public course open to the public. We have adults that go out there to play, practice, hit balls. And I will make sure that uh, Laura Nix, who's director of First Tee, gets the, uh, the number of of students, they also do outreach. I know they they're going out to Director uh, Wright's uh, community center to do some programming. They go out into the public schools. It's part of the the First Tees charter is to spread not only the sport of golf but all of the uh, human development needs of teaching kids how to live right, do right, basically by the yeah. golf code of ethics. So I think this is, we'll get some more information out to you all. And uh, part of this is, if we look back, uh, some of the issue is that the, the city was not asked to fulfill some of its obligations because we've been able to do it with private donations over the past. But that is, uh, as many uh, organizations have seen, a shortfall in some charitable, organiz charitable donations. So we'll get more information to you. Thank you. Director Hines, can you uh, can you ask the director to be here next uh, Tuesday, please? Thank you, uh, Director Adcock. You answered my question, but I'd like for you to explain it to me, please. My question was: Is Mr. Eckhart over this golf course like he is with the other three golf courses? Since I've been corrected that this is for the public and not just for youth or children. Uh, I'd like to know why this does not come into Parks and Recreation and why he's not overseeing this. Uh, Director Eckhock, in the 99, uh, 1999 um, contract, uh, there's references to the World Golf Association. There's references to the first tee. Uh, I've looked at that for many years since this has come up. And when Mr. Carpenter opined, well, and he was involved in the original drafting, uh, he said, well, the city is the first tee. Um, and I'll, if he can explain that uh, if he would like to. But um, so uh, for the longest, uh, there's a, they, they have a board. Uh, that board hires the executive director. <coughs> Uh, so uh, John is not over, does not oversee that uh, golf course. What oversight do you have or do we have on the people they hire in the way they run the course? Yeah, again, they're not city employees, uh, just like the Art Center and, uh, employees are not city employees. Um, and so, again, the, the contracts are very similar in nature as far as what are the city's responsibilities are. They are city-owned. It is a city-owned building and a city-owned course. But we have no oversight of it. 
Uh, obviously, we have a, the obligation and the right to uh, look at their revenue and expenditures, but they don't uh, they don't report to the park staff. Have we ever audited their books? We have not. Is there any reason? I mean, we audit everything else in the city. Is there any reasons we're not auditing? To well, them? one of the um, one of the components, uh, one of the aspects of this review, uh, and uh, with the, the with the city attorney's office and, and their board is, should they become a component unit of the city? Uh, which that would mean, uh, just like the arts center, uh, that they would become part of our audit. So that's something that Sarah and her team are looking at. And we'll know more as we get into the overall operations. Uh, it looks like if we're looking at closing one of the golf courses that uh, we would want to look at this one fully too. And if we have employees that need to be relocated from that, we would look at this location. But oh, yeah. I would like for you to consider auditing the books and getting more control of it by Mr. Eckhart and Parks and Recreation. Yeah. And uh, I do believe uh, that as part of this review and analysis that we first T is one of the operations we'll be looking at. Okay, thank you. And item number seven, if everyone uh, else is finished. We're not quite there yet. Um, uh, Director Hines. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Eckhart, one of the other things in through this process of, of realizing that we've had a, a Tom, would you say an imperfect agreement that's been added to over the past is trying to rectify and, and clear up some of this, this stuff. And one of the things we've done is had Mr. Eckhart out and Mr. Warfield to take a look at the facilities, how we've maintained them as kind of a check, part of a check and balance from staff to verify that we are, uh, that, that organization is doing what it says it's, it's supposed to do. So uh, I'll make sure that he gives his opinion on that as well. And do you serve on their board? I do serve on their board. And I was I was asked uh, by our previous assistant city manager to be the liaison to that board, and I serve on their board from this this board. And uh, one note of clarification: actually, the art center employees are city employees. They're just not supervised by the city directly. They're supervised by uh, by the commission by the art center art center board. I think that's the parallel that Bruce was was mentioning. Now. Um, the first T board is not appointed by us, and I guess that's going to be something, Mr. Carpenter, if it's going to be consistent with some of these other um, semi-autonomous boards and commissions that are city commissions that we need to we need to look at. Okay, Mr. Carpenter, I'm trying to listen to a conversation. The last part, yes, that would be something we would be addressing in a final contract. All right, very good. Okay, item seven, uh, Director Ancock has a question on that. Mr. Moore, can you give us item number seven, please? Uh, Director Adcock, uh for the last several years around the country, there's been litigation as to what types of local and state taxes should be charged on the rental of hotel rooms. Um, Little Rock has, of course, the uh, what we commonly refer to as the hamburger tax, which deals with hotel rooms, and then we have our own sales tax, as does the county. The issue has arisen because of the internet, and uh, just to use numbers I can keep <laughs> up with in my head, assume for a moment that a room at the Capitol Hotel was $150 a night. There are places like Travelocity and Hotels.com which uh, arrange to get a group of rooms and then they will sell them on behalf of the local hotel. So they may sell a room at $100 a night. The, the client seems to be happy because they have saved $50 over the daily rate. But in fact, it only costs Hotels.com $50 a night. And so what has been happening is they've been paying the various taxes based upon their actual charge as opposed to what the charge was for staying at the hotel, and there's a differential there. Uh, Mr. Thrash brought a lawsuit a few years ago, and it, it got a favorable verdict in, in uh, the Jefferson Circuit Court. Uh, that is on appeal now to the Arkansas Supreme Court, and depending on how that comes out, it may be appealed a step further to the U.S. Supreme Court, but 
the favorable ruling means that local governments and local entities such as the AMP Commission would be entitled to receive some kind of payment for taxes that have not been paid over the course of years. Um, uh, Mr. Thrash is working with uh, uh, Peter Compey of Williams and Anderson and with two firms out of the state of Georgia and this has gotten to be pretty complex litigation so all this is is saying represent us if we get through and there's something to be done then you know go ahead and put in our claim for us so that we can get the monies we're entitled to the A&P Commission as I understand it is still using uh, John Baker for their specific uh, taxes issue, but this just basically says we want to be treated like Pine Bluff and North Little Rock and a bunch of other cities in the state and let you take care of this. But it, it would cover the uh, penny and a half that we charge as local sales tax. So, in addition to the AMP taxes. So, you have any idea how much money that would be? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, Director Richardson. Well, I guess that was going to be my question, Mayor. The last question Director Atcock asked was, does it have any physical impact on us or will it cost us anything? It looks to me like it's not going to cost us anything at this moment. The answer is we're not going to write a check for an attorney's fee sure. because that will be taken out of whatever the recovery is. Uh, so we should get some monies back, but cost and fees will be taken out of that before anything's paid back. But any agreement we enter into, it won't cost us anything on the front end. No. To be recouped. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We can now move Mayor. on. Mayor. Oh, yes, Mr. Moore. Uh, just to clarify on item six, uh, and I, I did double check this, the, the art center employees are not city employees. Um, uh, they are eligible for uh, some of our benefits, but they are not city employees. Just, I just wanted to clarify that. We don't advertise those positions? We do not. All right. My, my former president over there said we were, but I guess we'll have to make sure they understand that as well. <laughs> All right. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, we move on to the planning and development items. Let me ask for any comments or questions or presentations. <laughs> Director Hancock, did you have a question? Uh, item, item 14, please. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the board. Scott, if you'll bring up the zoning map, it'll kind of give them an idea of where this property is. This property is located, you know, off of Henderson Road. It is in the extraterritorial. Um, if you sc uh, scroll down to the vicinity map, it's out just west of Crystal Valley Road. Crystal Valley ends, and uh, so it's just west of that. What this uh, application was that was... Uh, denied because of a 5 5 vote at the Planning Commission was uh, Scott. If you go to the sketch plan that's on there, it was a, uh, a lot split uh, out there. Now, majority of the tracks that are out there off Innocent Road are five acre tracks. So, in this lot split, there was going to get two lots, one about 2.26 acres, another one about 2.71 acres. Uh, there was two um, main items as far as technical-wise for staff on this application was uh, we have a, a ratio for lots. That's a three-to-one ratio saying that the uh, we don't want the depth of the lot to be three times more than what the width is. So, in that lot split, uh, that's what that had needed a variance for that lot, but it's going to make a longer lot. The second technical issue was uh, because it is out in the exterritorial and sewer service is not provided, it was going to be on 
a uh, septic system. And right now there is an existing home out there, so the concerns of staff were is, there, is the other lot going to be serviceable uh, through the septic, and we would require that they get a Arkansas Department of Health letter uh, of approval that they're going to be able to use the, have the lines ran, and, and they did that. Uh, in the presentation uh, to the Planning Commission, there were several uh, and in there for opposition. Seven spoke against uh, the item. The dominant uh, concern in the uh, opposition was the split in the acreage, just because there was a lot of large tracks out there. Uh, another opposition was just concerning uh, gunfire and uh, around the area. And in the, the vote, it was five to five. So in that, this tie means that it was denied. Well, the, uh, the complaint was uh, that the owners of the property were shooting guns out in the, on their property in the direction of adjacent property. Uh, that is not something that we, as a city enforcer area, that is a county, a sheriff, you know, complaint that they need to do. And there is, you know, laws on the books to, you know, what they can and can't do, you know, out there in that situation. It was, it was, the way that it was described was just a, something that the homeowners, the property owners had set up for them to shoot, you know, on their property. It's residential. No, right now there's only one uh, uh, home on the property. Well, the, they're wanting to split it. You know, the, putting a mobile home on the property would be a different uh, type of use uh, that's on there. They have to get approval for that. This is just for a, a split, a, you know, splitting of the lots. For a, you know, single-family home use on both of them. So that would be go from one, so it would be two. You allow for lot one would be able to have a residence, and lot two would be able to have a residence. Well, it was denied at the Planning Commission because it was a 5-5 vote. And so it was a tie, and on a tie, it defaults to a denied. And this is being appealed. And all the people can be Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, don't go too far away. Uh, Director Wyrick, you recognize, please. Yes. Jamie, I was at the Planning Commission when this came up, and uh, the, the individuals that live around there were ad adamantly opposed to it, and one of the things that they did cite was the gun range. Um, but my question to you is, it seems like it's been a while since that came before planning. Is this appeal timely? Are they hitting the time frame to appeal? Isn't it like 30 days after the Planning Commission they have to appeal? And did they meet that 30 days? Yes, Or whatever the time limit days. is? Yeah, they did make that 30 days or we wouldn't have brought it before on the appeal. So it seems like it's been several months ago that this happened. So did we sandbag it and just now bringing it forward? Well, I don't know about sandbagging it, but, you know, there is a time frame that when we do present it based upon when we, you know, have the agenda for the board when it gets forward to you. Okay. Sandbagging was probably inappropriate. And, and, yeah, and also to clarify on the, the gun range, when you're talking mm -hmm. about a range, you know, Thinking of it like a, you know, the range that the police would have out right. at their facility and something that somebody would set up, you know, on their property, that's, that's two different scenarios. And, and I, we, the staff, did not investigate <coughs> that to see what they had out there. Yeah. I just, I'm just citing what the, the neighborhood folks said yes. whenever they came and to they, the meeting. And there was a complaint, but that mm -hmm. item, as far as somebody shooting out on the property, is not something that is considered in a plat scenario. That is, a, that is an enforcement issue with the county. Can you tell me when this came before the Planning Commission and when they uh, requested um, this to come before the board for an appeal, the dates? Well, it was the original. Uh, they met for the subdivision on June 6th, and then it was heard on the Planning Commission uh, initially June 28th of 2018. It was deferred, and then it came before for the final vote on August 9th. August 9th. And so then they had to make the appeal between August 9th and September 9th, and they met those dates. They met those dates. Okay, thank you. This seems like a long time ago, and uh, for us just now to be hearing it, thank you. All right, thank you, Jamie. 
All right. Anyone else have any other uh, comments or questions on items uh, uh, eight uh, uh, through the uh, end of the agenda? Uh, Director Adcock. Besides what's on the agenda. Besides the uh, items? Okay. Let's see if anybody has any other questions on the items. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, we're about finished. Director Adcock, go ahead, please. Yes. Mr. Carpenter, we had a situation arise a few weeks ago concerning one of the candidates for city board position number two. And there has been uh, lots of comments from the public about this. Uh, I've got uh, lots of people calling wanting to know why we would not do our job up here because they perceive that we should have done something back when all this came up. And I know that you tried. Um, in fact, one story in, the news, in one of the newspapers even said that I was a vote that stopped it, which that's not true. But I would like for you to explain to the public what happened, uh, how it's been handled, and what the outcome is going to be. Uh, uh, I'm going to give Director Richardson a point of personal privilege on this. He wanted to make a comment before Mr. Carpenter responds. And yes, I, yes, I'll, thank you, Mayor. I just point of, point of clarification. Uh, Mayor Tom, since this involved me and it's a race I'm involved in, uh, do I not need to recuse myself and leave the room with respect to any conversation on this issue? I know we're in an agenda meeting, but I, I have no preference one way or the other. I'm not going to change how I campaign, but with respect to protocol and, um, and legality, do I need to leave this room? Director Richardson, under the city's code of ethics, any time that a board member feels that there is a problem, they're allowed to recuse. Well, I, I will recuse on this, and I don't know if I need to. When I had a contract with an agency before, and whenever there was a conversation involving that contract with that agency, I would leave the room. So I'm not, I, I'm recusing from the conversation. I guess my question to you or the mayor or Bruce, do you guys think I need to leave the room for appearances sake? Director Richardson, the here. ordinance actually says you step oh. down from the dais, but what it's happened is people have typically left the room. Director Adcock, to answer your question, um, information was brought to my attention, I don't even remember the day now, but it questioned whether or not one candidate was qualified to be a candidate for a Ward 2 position. The reason for the question is that the address listed in the petitions to seek the office uh, was in Ward 1 and was not in Ward 2. Uh, I reviewed the statutes at that time and it became very clear that even a candidate has to be a resident of the ward that they wish to serve and therefore this person was not qualified to go forward. This information was brought to the attention of the Pulaski County Election Commission and we got a, uh, an email from their attorney saying that since the city clerk certified uh, the name forward that they weren't going to do anything. They did not mention the statute that says that the commission has to certify the name to the uh, county clerk in order for the ballots to be printed. They just said they weren't going to do anything. So then the question became, how do we deal with this situation? Um, the short answer is, is that the only way you can deal with it is to file an action that has two parts. One is a petition for a writ of mandamus, which is to direct an action by a public official, and the other one is to simultaneously file a, uh, an action for a declaratory judgment that the individual was not qualified. Um, in doing more research for the situation, we found that on the state, um, Secretary of State's website, the person is shown to be a resident of Ward 1 and that the voting registration for the individual was changed to May of this year in order to vote uh, in Little Rock during the elections. And so as at that point they were at Ward 1 and that had not changed. There was information that the person had recently moved to an address that is in Ward 2, but that didn't mean that they were at that address at the time they filed their petitions and therefore 
they were never legitimately a candidate. Arkansas, as you've heard from me, has an incredibly liberal FOI, which is very much in favor of disclosure. And because of some cases, basically out of Fort Smith, uh, attorneys can't call governing body members and ask for permission to do something. So I have taken the stance that I call and say, this is what I'm going to do, or send a letter or an email and say, this is what I'm going to do, uh, with the understanding that if anybody objects, then I'm not going to do it. It's because I can't poll a board, that would be a meeting, and the press has to be called, and everybody has to be present while I make the phone calls. I got objections from two people about uh, filing the action. You were not one of them. And uh, as a result of that, I did not proceed forward. And unless and until I get any direction, I can't. Okay. And will you tell us what the outcome will be if no action is taken? If no action is taken prior to the election to challenge the ballot position for this individual, if assuming that they still live in Ward 2, if they are elected, they would be allowed to serve. Will that have any impact on our bonds or on any other legislation this board might pass in the next four years? Director Adcock, I don't think so. Uh, that doesn't mean that somebody may not raise the issue, but uh, I've, I'm pretty... I think I have pretty thoroughly researched this issue, and this is the type of objection that has to be made prior to the election or it's waived. Okay. Thank you. I wanted this brought up, Mayor, because I'm hearing from people that this board is not doing our job, and I think that we all are very careful to make sure that we do our job and we do it in an honest and uh, accountable way with the public. So thank you, Mr. Carpenter, for that. All right. Very good. Uh, Director Wyrick, you're next, please. Okay, mine was on a different topic. That's fine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I'd push my button. Um, Mr. Moore, I've been to two uh, Southwest or two um, police precinct meetings. The first one was in uh, Northwest, and the second one was in Southwest. And there is a 44% increase in rape in our city. And um, when I was at Southwest, I was trying to get some information as to what these cases uh, involved. And I have yet to get to the bottom of why there's such an increase. It was a 22% increase in Southwest Little Rock. So I know there's some... Um, information that cannot be disclosed about the locations and details about the individuals that are involved in it. But I think a number of people are concerned about their safety. And if we had some breakdown as to uh, maybe what the situations were, it might be helpful when we go to our meetings. For instance, if there's some things that we can do to uh, protect ourselves, uh, maybe our behavior is a little bit different um, in in our activities, um, going to the car, going in stores, you know, in our homes, things like that, that would be helpful. But it's my understanding these are uh, kept in the major crime area, and the precincts don't have those kinds of those kinds of details. So that is a striking increase in our city, and I think it'd be helpful if we had some details about it, the details that you can provide, not not personal information about the individuals. Thank you. All right. Uh, Director Peck, you're next, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Bruce, I think you uh, said that we might have a briefing today about the rally on November the 10th. Uh, Director Peck, uh, there's another meeting on Thursday uh, with the Capitol uh, Police and State Police. I wanted to have that meeting. I uh, didn't be able to discuss it on Monday. Okay. I can wait. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else to come before us? Anybody else have anything else? All right. Thank you very much.